test 9. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Write all your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the real test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to test one, section one, on page thirty. Test one, section one. A woman wants to find out about a paragliding course. Listen to the conversation between the woman and the man and answer the questions. First, you have some time to look at questions one to seven. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played twice. Hello, Paragliders Paradise. How can I help you? Oh, hi. I'm interested in doing a course in paragliding. Which course are you interested in? Well, I'm not sure. What's available? Well, we've got the introductory course, which lasts for two days. Okay. Or there's the four-day beginners course, which is what most people do first. I'd tend to recommend that one. And there's also the elementary pilot course, which takes five to six days, depending on conditions. We might try the beginners course. The woman says they would like to try the beginners course, so the answer is B. The four-day beginners course. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully, and answer questions one to seven. Hello, Paragliders Paradise. How can I help you? Oh hi, I'm interested in doing a course in paragliding. Which course are you interested in? Well, I'm not sure. What's available? Well, we've got the introductory course, which lasts for two days. Okay. Or there's the four-day beginners course, which is what most people do first. I'd tend to recommend that one. And there's also the elementary pilot course, which takes five to six days, depending on conditions. We might try the beginners course. What sort of prices are we looking at? The introductory is one hundred and ninety dollars. The beginners course, which is probably what you'd be looking at, is three hundred and twenty dollars. No, sorry, three hundred and thirty. It's just gone up. And the pilot course is four hundred and thirty dollars. Right. And you also have to become a member of our club so that you're insured. That'll cost you twelve dollars a day. Everyone has to take out insurance, you see. Does that cover me if I break a leg? No, I'm afraid not. It's only third party and covers you against damage to other people or their belongings, but not theft or injury. You would need to take out your own personal accident insurance. I see. And what's the best way to get to your place? By public transport, or could we come by bike? We're pretty keen cyclists. It's difficult by public transport, though there is a bus from Newcastle. Most people get here by car, though, because we're a little off the beaten track. But you could ride here, okay? I'll send you a map. Just let me take down a few details. What's your name? Maria Gentle. And your address, Maria? Well, I'm a student staying with a family in Newcastle. So it's care of. Care of Mr. and Mrs. McDonald. Like the hamburgers. <laughs> yes, exactly. McDonald. The post office box address is probably best. It's P.O. Box six seven six Newcastle. Is there a fax number there? Because I could fax you the information. Yes, actually there is. 
It's 0249, that's for Newcastle, and then 775431. Okay, now if you decide to do one of our courses, you'll need to book in advance and to pay when you book. How would you be paying? Uh, by credit card, if that's okay. Do you take Visa? Yes, fine. We take all major cards, including Visa. OK, then. Thanks very much. The girl is telling her friend about the course. Look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen to their conversation and answer questions 8 to 10. Hi, Pauline. Hi, Maria. What's that you're reading? Just some information from a paragliding school. It looks really good fun. Do you fancy a go at paragliding? Sure. Do you have to buy lots of equipment and stuff? Not really. The school provides the equipment, but we'd have to take a few things along. Such as? Well, it says here, clothes, uh, wear stout boots. So no sneakers or sandals, I suppose. And clothes suitable for an active day in the hills. Preferably a long sleeve t-shirt. That's probably in case you land in the stinging nettles. It also says we should bring a packed lunch. We do not recommend soft drinks or flasks of coffee. <laughs> Water is really the best thing to drink. Uh, we need to bring suntan lotion and something to protect your head from the sun. Okay, that sounds reasonable. And where would we stay? Well, look, they seem to operate a campsite too because it says here that it's only $10 a day to pitch a tent. That'd be fine, wouldn't it? And that way would save quite a bit because even a cheap hotel would cost money. Uh, or perhaps we could stay in a bed and breakfast nearby. It gives a couple of names here we could ring. I think I might prefer that. <laughs> uh, hotels and youth hostels would all be miles away from the farm and I don't fancy a caravan. No, I agree. But let's take a tent and pray for good weather. OK, let's do it. <laughs> what about next weekend? No, I can't. I'm going on a geography field trip. And then it's the weekend before the exams and I really do need to study. OK, then. Let's make it the one after the exams. Fine. We'll need a break by then. Can you ring and let me know if you can find out... That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2 on page 32. Test 1, section 2. You will hear a reporter talking on the radio about old racing cars. First, look at questions 11 to 16. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions 11 to 16. The Goodwood Museum is currently celebrating some of the most extravagant types of car design in its Festival of Speed. Here's our reporter, Vincent Freed, who's on site to tell us about some of the cars on display. Well, here I am, standing in front of one of the most prestigious cars ever built, the Duesenberg. A fantastically expensive, luxurious car built in the early part of the 20th century and bearing all the glamorous qualities of the Jazz Age. How many were there? Well, only 473 Duesenberg J-types were ever built, and the model here is one of the rarest. Each had a short 125-inch chassis or framework, and the body was always in the form of an open two-seater. 
The technology behind the car's 6.9-litre engine was extraordinary. It featured capsules of mercury in the engines to absorb vibration and provide an incredibly smooth ride. In fact, these cars offered unparalleled performance. In an age when 160 kilometers per hour was considered very fast, the Duesenberg promised a top speed of 180 kilometers per hour and could do 140 kilometers per hour in second gear. Duesenberg, who designed the car, sold it as a frame and engine. This was typical of the age again, and many prestige manufacturers such as Rolls-Royce did exactly the same. Owners able to afford the hefty $9,000 price tag for the basic car would then commission a coachwork company to build a body tailored to their own individual requirements. The Duesenberg's great attraction for the driver was its instrument panel, which offered all the usual features, but also several others, including a stopwatch. It was the Duesenberg's technology that lay behind its success as a racing car, and they dominated the American racing scene in the 1920s, winning the Indianapolis Grand Prix in 1924, 25 and 27. Now look at questions 17 to 20. As the talk continues, answer questions 17 to 20. On to another celebrity, the 1922 Leia Helica. Only 30 of these French propeller cars were built, and the model here at Goodwood, which was the fourth to be made, is thought to be the only surviving example still capable of running. The brains behind this car was Marcel Leia, who was an aviation pioneer first and foremost, and the influence of flying is quite apparent in the car. The layer very strongly resembles a light aircraft with its front propeller, but in this case, it's minus any wings, of course. It's quite odd to think that this car was whirring through France just as the Duesenberg was blasting down roads at 160 kilometers per hour across the Atlantic. The layers were used regularly in France in the 1920s and were even produced in saloon and van form, as well as two-seater. The Leia matched its propeller drive with its equally bizarre steering, which used the rear rather than the front wheels. But despite looking rather frail, it was a tough machine. In fact, when troops tried to steal it during the Second World War, the car's baffling design was clearly beyond the would-be thieves, and it ended up being driven into a tree, breaking the propeller. And now for the Firebird, this extraordinary... That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3 on page 55. You will hear a discussion about a system of writing for the blind known as Braille. First look at questions 21 to 23. Now listen to the first part of the discussion and complete the notes for questions 21 to 23. Um, we're very pleased to welcome to our special interest group today Dr Linda Graycar, who is from the City Institute for the Blind. Linda is going to talk to us about the system of writing for the blind 
known as Braille. Linda, welcome. Thank you. Now, we'd like to keep this session pretty informal, mm -hmm. and I know Linda won't mind if members of the group want to ask questions as we go along. Mm -hmm. Well, let's start with an obvious one. What is Braille, and where does it get its name from? Well, as you said, Braille is a system of writing used by and for people who cannot see. Uh, it gets its name from the man who invented it, the Frenchman Louis Braille, who lived in the early 19th century. Was Louis Braille actually blind himself? Well, he wasn't born blind, but he lost his sight at the age of three as the result of an accident in his father's workshop. Uh, Louis Braille then went to Paris to the National Institute for Blind Children, and that's where he invented his writing system at the age of only 15 in 1824, while he was at the Institute. But he wasn't the first person to invent a system of touch reading for the blind, was he? No, another Frenchman had already come up with the idea of printing embossed letters that stood out from the paper, but this was very cumbersome and inefficient. Did um, Louis Braille base his system on, on the first one? No, not really. When he first went to Paris, he heard about a military system of writing using 12 dots. This was a system invented by an enterprising French army officer, and it was known as night writing. It wasn't meant for the blind, but rather for battle communications at night. That must have been fun. <laughs> Look at questions 24 to 30. Listen carefully and answer questions 24 to 30. Anyway, Braille took this system as a starting point, but instead of using the 12 dots which night writing used, he cut the number of dots in half and developed a six-dot system. Uh, can you give us a little more information about how it works? Well, it's a system of touch reading which uses an arrangement of raised dots called a cell. Braille numbered the dot positions 1, 2, 3 downward on the left and 4, 5, 6 downward on the right. The letters of the alphabet are then formed by using different combinations of these dots. Mm. Uh, yes? So, is the writing system based on the alphabet with each word being individually spelt out? Well, <laughs> it's not quite that simple, I'm afraid. For instance, the first ten letters of the alphabet are formed using dots 1, 2, 4 and 5. But Braille also has its own short forms for common words. For example, B for the word but and H for have. There are many other contractions like this. So you spell out most words letter by letter, mm -hmm. but you use short forms for common words? Yes. Though I think that makes it sound a little easier than it actually is. And was it immediately accepted? I mean, did it catch on straight away? Well, yes and no. <laughs> um, it was immediately accepted and used by Braille's fellow students at the school, but the system was not officially adopted until 1854, two years after Braille's death. So official acceptance was slow in coming. I suppose it works for all languages which use the Roman alphabet. Yes, it does, with adaptations, of course. Can it be written by hand, or do you need a machine to produce Braille? Well, you can write it by hand onto paper with a device called a slate and stylus. But the trick is that you have to write backwards, from right to left, so that when you turn your sheet over, the dots face upwards and can be read like English from left to right. Oh, I see. But these days, you'd probably use a Braille writing machine, which is a lot easier. And uh, tell us, Linda, is Braille used in other ways, other than for reading text? Yes, indeed. In addition to the literary Braille code, as it's known, which, of course, includes English and French, there are other codes. 
For instance, in 1965, they created a form of Braille for mathematics. I can't imagine trying to do maths in Braille. Yes, that does sound difficult, I agree. And there's also a version for scientific notation. Oh, and yes, I almost forgot. There is now a version for music notation as well. Well, thanks, Linda. That was most interesting. Now, does anyone have any last questions? Yes. Roughly, how long does it take to learn to read Braille? Can you do this? Listen carefully and answer questions 24 to 30. Now turn to section 4 on page 56. Test 2, section 4. You will hear a talk about memory in babies and young children. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 35. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 35. We're going to look today at some experiments that have been done on memory in babies and young children. Our memories, it's true to say, work very differently, depending upon whether we are very old, very young, or somewhere in the middle. But when exactly do we start to remember things, and how much can we recall? One of the first questions that we might ask is, do babies have any kind of episodic memory? Can they remember particular events? Obviously, we can't ask them, so how do we find out? Well, one experiment that's been used has produced some interesting results. It's quite simple and involves a baby in its cot, a colourful mobile and a piece of string. It works like this. If you suspend the mobile above the cot and connect the baby's foot to it with the string, the mobile will move every time the baby kicks. Now you can allow time for the baby to learn what happens and enjoy the activity. Then you remove the mobile for a time and reintroduce it some time from 1 to 14 days later. If you look at this table of results at the top two rows, you can see that what is observed shows that two-month-old babies can remember the trick for up to two days and three-month-old babies for up to a fortnight. And although babies trained on one mobile will respond only if you use the familiar mobile, if you train them on a variety of colours and designs, they will happily respond to each one in turn. Now, looking at the third row on the table, you will see that when they learn to speak, babies as young as 21 months demonstrate an ability to remember events which happened several weeks earlier. And by the time they are two, some children's memories will stretch back over six months, though their recall will be random, with little distinction between key events and trivial ones. And very few of these memories, if any, will survive into later life. So, we can conclude from this that even very tiny babies are capable of grasping and remembering a concept. Look at questions 36 to 40.
Now answer questions 36 to 40. So, how is it that young infants can suddenly remember for a considerably longer period of time? Well, one theory accounting for all of this, and this relates to the next question we might ask, is that memory develops with language. Very young children with limited vocabularies are not good at organising their thoughts. Though they may be capable of storing memories, do they have the ability to retrieve them? One expert has suggested an analogy with books on a library shelf. With infants, he says, it's as if early books are hard to find because they were acquired before the cataloguing system was developed. But even older children forget far more quickly than adults do. In another experiment, several six-year-olds, nine-year-olds and adults were shown a staged incident. In other words, they all watched what they thought was a natural sequence of events. The incident went like this. A lecture, which they were listening to, was suddenly interrupted by something accidentally overturning. In this case, it was a slide projector. To add a third stage, and make the recall more demanding, this accident was then followed by an argument. In a memory test the following day, the adults and the nine-year-olds scored an average 70%, and the six-year-olds did only slightly worse. In a retest five months later, the pattern was very different. The adults' memory recall hadn't changed, but the nine-year-olds had slipped to less than 60%, and the six-year-olds could manage little better than 40% recall. In similar experiments with numbers, digits... That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. At the end of the real test, you will have ten minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet. This is the end of side two.